Well, a few weeks ago, I uh, took, a few, took a few days off and uh, went to Rocky Mountains and did a little bit of fly fishing. Love, love going fly fishing. And one day, I hiked three miles up to this lake that's at about 10,000 feet. Uh, and on one end of this, pretty, actually a pretty good sized lake, but on one end of that lake, there's this little cove. And so I took this blurry picture here <laughs> of uh, me on this end of the fly rod. And uh, a little bit later, on the other end, there'll be this nice rainbow trout. And we got to spend a little time together. And I, I really enjoyed that. And that was a good, good day. That was a really good day. And as I was spending the day up there, and as I was hiking back down uh, to my car a little bit later that day, and even for about another day or so, I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, there are people who retire and move places where they can do this as much as they want. There are, there are people who can go fly fishing or bass fishing, whatever they want to do, every day. There are people who can go hiking every day. And there are people who move to certain areas after they retire because they want to play golf more. Maybe some of you have moved to a golf community here. There are people who, upon their retirement, they're really kind of focused on traveling and, uh, and, and just doing things like that. And after a little while of thinking of that, I, I also began to wonder, I wonder what real estate goes for around here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe one more thing could work out somehow. Um, and then I remembered something that happened a few years ago that made me kind of change my mind on all that. Uh, I had a friend, uh, a guy that I knew, uh, by the name of Stanley Ship. And uh, Stanley lived in St. Louis, Missouri. And he, was, he flew to Nashville, Tennessee to speak at a conference that we were hosting at the church I was at in Bowling Green, Kentucky, about an hour north of Nashville. And Stanley's a very frugal guy. He's been dead for several years now. But he, uh, he would always, when he traveled, get the most economical car that he could rent when I mean, he went to the airport, the, most, the cheapest one he could get. And lo and behold, this particular day, he got bumped up to a luxury car. And uh, so, okay, that's fine, that's great. And so he got in it and was driving, it was at night, and uh, driving up to Bowling Green. And he, as he was driving along, he began to think, man, this thing's really nice. This is nice, I, I can get used to this. Uh, and he, it was so comfortable and it drove so easy. And he, he said to himself, you know, when I get back to St. Louis, I think I'm going to see about getting one of these. And all of a sudden... He veered over to the side of I-65, which is about like I-35 as far as traffic. It's at night, gets off, off, off to the side, he puts the car in park, he gets out, he walks around in front of it, and standing in the headlights, he points his finger at that car and says, I know what you're trying to do to me. <laughs> and he got back in, came on to Bowling Green, and that's kind of what I ended up doing with my fly rod that day. It would have been a whole lot more dramatic if I thought to do it while I was there, to actually walk out into the water and point my finger at it. But I, I did it mentally anyway, that I, I know what you're trying to do. There's absolutely nothing wrong with fishing and golfing and traveling and luxury cars and any of that stuff, as long as we're being good stewards of our finances and our time, and, and especially as long as those things don't become the priority of our lives. And I think many times, especially once we reach retirement, that's, that can very easily happen. Well, the reason I'm sharing this is because today, as a part of this series on parenting, Pastor Brian has asked me to talk about grandparenting. I'm the only one on the staff who qualifies <laughs> for this, at least from an experience perspective. And, uh, and I think right up front, there are a couple of misconceptions about grandparenting that we need to talk about. And I, I see these with myself and I, I see them in others as well sometimes. And the first misconception is that once our kids become adults, our job is over. Doesn't always work that way. In fact, it never really works that way. Once, once they're adults, then, then we're kind of through with them. It's, we think sometimes in terms of, of running a relay race. And so I run my leg of the race, and then I hand the baton off, the baton off to my kids, and then they take off, and I just move off the track and perhaps collapse for a little while and catch my breath, and then I go fishing, and I go hiking, and I go golfing, and that's what my life is going to be about from, from this point on. Well, 
The Bible has something to say about that. And we've actually kind of touched on it a little bit in the past couple of weeks, some of the, the, the passages that, that Brian has talked about. One in particular is in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. Uh, the, the people are, of Israel are transitioning from the desert into the promised land. And in, in verse 9, uh, the Bible says to watch out you know, in this new land. Be, you better be careful here. Be careful never to forget what you yourself have seen. Do not let these memories escape from your mind as long as you live. And be sure to pass them on to your children. So as you're, as you're going into this land, you've got to remember how you got here. You've got to remember who you are, and you share those lessons with, their, with your children. And Brian has given us some really great insights about what that looks like and how we might be able to do that. But as you notice at the end of, of that verse, in that sentence, there's those three little dots and ellipses. Uh, an, el an ellipsis means that there's something else here that we're kind of setting aside because we want to talk about other things. And Brian has shown great restraint <laughs> these past couple of weeks and not talking about what goes where those, those three little dots are so we could have a full uh, a sermon devoted to it fully today. Let's look at those three little dots because they're really, really important. What he says in this passage is, um, that, that be sure to pass these lessons on to your children and who? Your grandchildren. Some translations of the Bible say, and your children's children. It's all kind of the same thing. Well, what he doesn't say here is that you, you've got this thing, we'll just, this deal that we'll call faith. And you, you take your faith and you pass it on to your children and you equip them, you set them up so that they can then pass it on to their children, but that's their responsibility. You can just, you can kind of back off a little bit and again, go, go fishing. That's not what he says. He says that there are, there's a twofold responsibility that God has given us. One is to take this thing called faith and give it to our children as, as best we can. And that's, that's like 1A of what we're told to do. 1B is we then pass it on to our grandchildren. That is, that is my responsibility. Now, it's different. The, the parents bear the primary, primary responsibility for doing that, but, but I have a role in that somehow, that it is something that, that, that we are continuing to do. Now, I can, I can just feel this kind of cloud of depression coming down, especially settling on those of you who are parents of teenagers. <laughs> Because some of you are probably thinking, you know, you mean my 16-year-old daughter, I can't say just five more years and I'm done. Nope, you can't, you can't do that. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. And the Bible doesn't even stop there. There's, there's more to this. And stay with me. Don't be afraid. It'll be okay. But, and there's a psalm, Psalm 78. And uh, I, I want to read a portion of this psalm. You can listen or you can follow along on the screen that does even more with this. Psalm 78, verse 1. O oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable, which is quoted in the New Testament in reference to Jesus. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he, he issued his laws to Jacob, he gave his instructions to Israel, he commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children, so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children, so each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. And so this idea of just being concerned about the next generation, about our kids, it's not enough. That really isn't what the Bible tells us. Instead, he writes of one generation who tells their children, who tells their children, who tell their children, and really it would go on really for uh, forever, but those are the, the kind of the four generations that he talks about. We have a responsibility, each of us, if you're a parent right now, you have a responsibility for four generations. I, I don't know, but I, you know, and that's, that's a pretty long time. <laughs> in fact, in, in population demography, 
A generation can be anywhere from 20 to 30 years. Let's just kind of go in the middle, let's say 25 years. Um, that means that our vision for families is too small. We don't need to think just in terms of 18 years or 21 years. We need a 100-year vision. A 100-year vision. We have this, this view toward the future, and we we're wondering about those who come after us for generations, and we're concerned about them, and we want to make an impact upon their, their lives. There is a, a tribe in Africa, and, and I think even to this day, uh, they still do this. When, that, when someone travels from village to village, there is a particular greeting, a customary greeting that they will use when they, when they go to another village that's part of the same tribe. We might do that when we, you know, we, go, we talk to somebody who's from Round Rock. How, how are things going in Round Rock? Something like that. Well, their, their uh, traditional way of greeting someone from another village is to ask, how are the children? How are the children? In other words, the health of that society is gauged by the well-being of the children, even in another place. And, and no matter what might be going on, if, if, the, you know, if, the, if the crops are bad and there's a drought and there are enemies, all sorts of things going on, the children are doing well, then, then we can get through it. It's okay. But, but it, it goes the other way as well. And so, so uh, how, how are we taking care of the children? And I think that kind of describes the vision that we need as Christian mothers and fathers and grandparents and aunt and uncles that our, our concern is for the well-being, not just of our children, but uh, the generations that, that follow. So what's, what's your strategy for that? What's your strategy for that? If you're going to have a 100-year vision for anything, it probably isn't going to happen just by accident. In fact, I don't think we're really going to convey anything to the next generation if it's, if it's just by accident. There, there, we need to be intentional about pursuing this 100-year vision. What does that look like for you? Honestly, I don't, I don't have that <laughs> developed near as much as I would like to. I don't think I really have a very good 100-year vision, which is one of the reasons why I'm really excited about the Legacy Grandparenting Summit. Uh, we're going to be a simulcast host for that this coming Thursday and Friday uh, where we'll, we'll get some resources on how we can do a better job as, as grandparents. Something really interesting that I have noticed is that, you know, for, for probably about the last 50 years or so, the church has, the church universal has provided a lot of resources for parents. Um, I think maybe a lot of that started with focus on the family, and then there are others that, that, that came along. Uh, maybe some of you, as an example, are familiar with Tim Kimmel, who founded a ministry decades ago called Family Matters. Uh, he wrote a book, did a video series called Grace-Based Parenting. Maybe some of you have been through that series. Uh, there's people like Ken Canfield. Ken uh, started the, um, the uh, National Center for Fathering in 1980. Uh, maybe some of you read his book, The Seven Secrets of Effective Fathers or the Heart of a Father. Well, what I, I find interesting about that is that now those people who were writing and talking about parenting, they have become grandparents. And they're bringing those same gifts and those same abilities and those writing skills and research and, and uh, ministries into the area of grandparenting. And so Tim and Darcy Kimmel... Uh, they wrote Grace-Based Parenting. Now they've written a book called Extreme Grandparenting. And Ken Canfield, who uh, founded the National Center for Fathering, is still involved in that. But mostly he's focused on another group that he uh, founded, the National Association of Grandparenting. Well, guess who's going to be speaking at the Legacy Grandparenting Summit? Tim and Darcy Kimmel and Ken Canfield and about a dozen other just really uh, powerful speakers and equippers uh, that are bringing these resources that we need. And it's not too late to participate in that. It'll be from 9 to 4.30 on Thursday and Friday. I'll be at one of the kiosks in the back. Be glad to talk to you about registering for that. Love to have you be a part of that. But my, my point is that as we are realizing the role that grandparents can play 
and that grandparents really are called to play, resources are appearing. Help is coming. And I'm, I'm just so thankful for that because uh, I, I see this as a divine imperative. And I don't want to fail at this. I, I don't, I don't want to fail. I don't want to do a mediocre job as a grandfather. And I feel like I need to step it up a little bit. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful these resources are, are appearing. A few years ago, I, uh, I, was, I got a phone call from a funeral director, funeral home director. You guys have had these, had these calls where someone has died, they didn't have a church, um, and, uh, and so they, they need, you know, maybe a spouse or a parent or somebody who wants a pastor to come and speak at their service, a little fire insurance, you know, to make sure they're, they're okay, I guess. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't, this, I mean, this guy hadn't been to church probably ever. And let me just say right now that uh, you don't want to meet the pastor who's going to speak at your funeral while you're laying in a coffin, okay? <laughs> Just, you know, that doesn't work very well. It's a little bit awkward, a little bit awkward for me. I mean, what do, what do I say? Oh, he looks so natural. I don't know what he looked like. How could, I mean, how can I answer that, say that, you know? I don't know where we get that to start with. Why, why do we say that he looks so natural? Does that mean he looked dead all the time, you know? I mean, it's, it's kind of an unusual uh, saying that we've got. But So anyway, I, I get a call. And this guy wants me to come and, and do this funeral for this guy. And so I went and uh, met him <laughs> and met his wife. Actually, it was his common-law wife. They'd never been married, but they lived together long enough that she had the, the rights of a, of a spouse. So she was there. Her daughter was there. A neighbor, who was also their mailman, was there. And then his son, who... Um, from his previous marriage, who showed up right as we began and left as soon as we were finished. We, we had to use funeral home employees as this man's pallbearers. And I, as I was in this situation, I just I wanted to say to the guy, is that it? Is, is this what you have done with your life? God, God breathed life into you, and you did so little with that life. You made such a, a minor impact that there were not even enough people to carry you to your grave. And that just seemed to me to be a, a huge waste of what could have been a, a life with greater potential than that. And that's kind of how I feel about being a grandparent. I, I don't want... God to look to me and say, man, I, there was so much I wanted you, there were so many generations I wanted you to impact, and wh why didn't you make a, a bigger impact than you did? And I, I think that leads to the, really the second uh, misconception about what it means to be a grandparent. The first one is that we are finished when our kids are grown, and the other really uh, revolves around what it means to be a good grandparent. I used to say... <laughs> But I'm not saying this anymore, that grandparenting is easy. It's easy. Uh, all we do is we love on them, we give them hugs, we play Uno, uh, we give them cookies and cakes and a lot of sugar, maybe a little cup of coffee every now and then, and send them home to their parents, you know, <laughs> getting even with them for all the, the trouble they, they caused us. Uh, it's easy to be a grandparent. And you see this in, in a lot of the children's literature that's out there. For example, uh, Harriet uh, Zeifert, uh, in her books, the, the titles kind of say it all, that grandmas are forgiving tickles. Probably some of your grandkids like that book. Uh, and grandpas are for finding worms. You know, we get the dirty words so we can, can take them fishing. But that's what grandmas and grandpas are for. Or Laura Numeroff, who has written a couple of books, or several actually, but one called uh, What Grandmas Do Best, and another one called What Grandpas Do Best. And what we do best, according to these books, is playing hide-and-seek, singing lullabies, building a sandcastle, and playing games. Was well, that what grandparents do? 
you better believe it's what grandparents do. Absolutely we do those things. And that's, that is the good part. That's the easy part of what it means to be a grandparent. We love doing those sorts of things. But, but we, we do it with a higher purpose than that. And we, we want to kind of use the relationship. We want to leverage that for kingdom purposes. And here's, here's why we need to be concerned about that. David Kenneman is the president of the Barna Group, a, a very uh, res- well-respected research organization. And in a book that uh, he wrote several years ago called Faith for Exiles, they looked at, at teenagers who were kind of across the spectrum of doing really well spiritually and then, and then some and those who were struggling. And there were five common features for, that were shared by young people who were doing well spiritually. And one of those five common features was they could say, I feel valued by the people in my life who are older than me. 65% of those who were doing well spiritually could say, yes, that, I, I, that's true of me. Only 24% of those that were considered to be prodigals or even ex-Christians. And let me just say as an aside here that uh, Keith, uh, Pastor Keith on Wednesday evenings is doing these um, parenting roundtables uh, where you get together and just talk about parenting things that are related to the series that we're doing. And I'm going to join him this week. And we're going to talk about intergenerational parenting because some of you might right now be thinking, you know, I, I want this for my kids, but, you know, the grandparents aren't living or the grandparents live far away or maybe uh, my kids' grandparents don't share the spiritual values that I have. And so, so what do we do? And we'll talk about some of those sorts of things. But, you know, and that research showed that, that, that grandparents have a, a big influence. And there's another study that appeared in the Christian Education Journal. Uh, it was an article about a, a, actually a doctoral dissertation on the impact of grandparents. And this article said this, these, the statements of these children that they were talking about in the study, as well as data from other empirical studies, offer strong support for the idea that grandparents nurture their grandchildren's relationship with God through their frequent prayers, their stories, their clear example, their quiet witness, their availability, and especially their ability to lavish love, grace, and mercy on grandchildren in deep need of such gifts. That's how we can have an influence. Maybe we found our strategy. Maybe maybe that's how we can uh, approach this 100-year vision that God has given us, that we're praying for our grandkids. That kind of goes without saying, but we need to put it out. We're, We're praying for them frequently. We're, we're telling stories, and we'll come back to that in, in just a moment. Through our example, through our witness, just a quiet witness even sometimes, through being available for them and lavishing them. I love that, that word. We're lavishing them with love, grace, and mercy. If a child has that, if anyone has that really, from other people, they are going to do well in life. They're going to do well in their, in their relationship with God. They're going to be influenced by those people. They will be better people because of the legacy of a grandparent when grandparents are doing these sorts of things. And so that's, that's how we leverage this special relationship that we have for eternal purposes. And he tells us why in verse 7. Uh, really, you might think of this as, as three goals for grandparents from Psalm 78, and, but again, not limited to grandparents. For that 100-year um, uh, uh, descendants that follow you, wherever you are right now, maybe it's nephews and nieces, maybe you don't even have kids yet, but this is, this is the goal that you will have for generations that follow you from uh, Psalm 78, verse 7. I want to back up and start in verse, verse 5, where he says that he commanded our ancestors to teach these instructions to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. Why? What, what's, what's the end game here? Verse 7, so each generation should set its hope in you on God. Each generation, in other words, has their own personal encounter with God. I, I know of people, you do as well, I'm sure, who are, you know, they belong to a certain church. They're members of a certain religion, even, or denomination. 
Uh, and the only reason is because their grandparents were a part of that church. Or their great, my, you know, my great grandfather started this church. And it, <clears throat> I never attend, has no meaning, makes no impact on my life. But I'm this, or I belong to this, solely because others who before me were a part of that. Well, that's not something that's of real, real spiritual significance that's going, going to carry over. Um, it, it's, it's a kind of a difficult thing, an impossible thing, really, to, to pass on someone else's faith. And what equips the next generation to be able to pass something on to the generation after them is their own experience. Each generation sets its heart anew on God. And, and then as they do that, as they have these new experiences and new encounters and uh, new faith, he adds to that, not forgetting his glorious miracles. And that's where the stories come in. Not just stories from the Bible, but our own stories, our own experiences. Kids love hearing stories. You know, once upon a time, you know, a galaxy far, far away, you know, every how you want to begin it, they, they'll get their attention. You may lose it quickly, but you've got their attention. They, they love hearing stories, and they love hearing Bible stories, but even how much more meaningful would it be if they heard your story? If, imagine if your grandkids, and maybe even their grandkids, knew your conversion story. That maybe it wasn't anything really, you know, all that big of a deal, but you told it enough, and you told it with enough uh, passion and significance that they remembered it. They remembered why great-grandma or great-grandpa became Christians. Or, or they, you, you told them a story about some struggle in your life and how, man, this was a hard thing, but I, but I prayed, and here's how God answered that prayer. Or, or maybe I had something going on, and I, God didn't answer it the way I prayed, and, and how I dealt with that, and how that impacted my faith. What, what an incredible impact that could make. God is a God of personal power. And the task that is before us is to convey to our kids and grandkids through our own experience that God wants to use that power on their behalf. And so we, we tell them those stories of his glorious miracles. And then finally, the third part of this goal is obeying his commands. If future generations obey God's commands because they have set their hope in you on him and they've heard his, the, the stories of how he's worked in your life, we have been successful. I don't care whatever else they're doing. If, if, if they have done that, if they've come into a relationship with God because of that influence, then, then we have been successful. I just I want it to be said of me that, that, that my kids, to some small degree, were influenced toward God through me, not in spite of me. That, that they, they, know, they know my stories. They, they know our stories as a family. They know the ways that God has worked and, and, and what he means to me. Uh, I don't want to be an obstacle for God to work around. I don't want to face him in judgment someday and say, well, you know, I, I put you in this situation. There are people I wanted you to influence, people, descendants of yours, but it seems like your biggest desire was to sit in your recliner all day and watch TV while the kids played in the other room. I, I want to have an impact. If, if your grandchildren... And their grandchildren follow in your footsteps. Where will it lead them? Will it lead them to God or will it lead them away from him? Just a moment, we're going to, we're going to close by hearing this passage again in a, in a very special way. Uh, but I want, I want to share this thought before we do. It's a well-known passage in Matthew where Jesus asked the disciples, Who do people say that I am? What are, they, what are they saying? What's the word on the street? Who do people say that I am? And there were different options that were given. And it's Peter who speaks up and says, well, you're the Christ, the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And in Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus says, and I tell you, you're Peter. And on this rock, this confession of his identity, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And what I've always pictured with that is, you know, that, what that means is we are safe, we are protected, that, that Satan is not going to be able to, to penetrate us. You know, the, the church is, is uh, 
surrounded by angels and surrounded by Jesus and he can't get to us. And whereas that's true, that's not really what Jesus is saying in this, in this passage. A gate isn't an offensive weapon. A gate is for defensive purposes. And so what I think Jesus is really driving at here is that the church is taking the fight to Satan. We, we are looking and seeing in this world where, where he has strongholds. And we go there and we involve ourselves. And, and we're making an impact and we're just step by step. We are about the business of driving him farther and farther away, farther and farther toward the abyss to which Jesus will someday cast him. Well, that charge has been given to the church for over 2000, almost 2,000 years. From generation to generation, that charge has been passed down. And as we think about the next 100 years, as, as you think about your ancestors that will follow you, will they take up their place in this battle? Will, will they be marching out and, and involved in spiritual warfare that will knock down the gates of hell. I want, to be, I want us to be intentional matriarchs and intentional patriarchs, not just for the sake of our kids, not just so they'll have good lives. I want to do that for God's sake. I want to do that for the sake of his kingdom. You know, we, we sometimes, uh, rightly so, think about, how we can keep our grandkids and kids safe. We want to keep them safe, you know, physically, emotionally, mentally. Most of all, we want to keep them safe spiritually. And let's, let's do that. But let's not stop at making our kids and grandkids safe. Let's make them dangerous. Let's make them dangerous to what Satan is trying to do in this world. And I have no doubt whatsoever that God has plans for the people who are coming from you. And, and maybe there are some of your grandchildren's grandchildren that God wants to give this special measure of prayer or this special gift of service. Maybe there's someone to whom he will give the gift of preaching and they'll be able to influence hundreds of people. Maybe he'll do it through a, a, a great, great grandchild who is, has special needs. God does some of his best work through, through those folks. I mean, I don't know what the possibilities are, but, but it's out there. God has plans for your descendants. God has plans that reach beyond that 100-year vision. Let's, let's prepare them to take their place in his kingdom. Let's prepare them to fulfill the plans that God has for them. I hope you'll be encouraged in that as we close out with this video.